series, which are all at now. Thank you so much. Um, this reading series connects poets from Chicago and beyond with audiences all over the city. As I mentioned earlier, this event is co-sponsored by Kundimon, which is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to nurturing generations of writers and readers of Asian American literature. To extend Kundimon's ver uh, vision of community building for Asian American writers everywhere, Kundimon has developed a national network of regional groups to host their own salons, readings, and workshops. Kundimon Midwest supports the live captioning of the Blue Hours readings and workshops, and members of the regional group are featured in the reading series. Again, thank you all so much for joining us for the second reading of our season. And now it's my pleasure to introduce your host, Marty McConnell. Marty McConnell is the author of When They Say You Can't Go Home Again, What They Mean Is You Were Never There, winner of the 2017 Michael Waters Poetry Prize. Her, her first full-length collection, Wine for a Shotgun, received the silver medal in the Independent Publishers Awards and was a finalist for both the Audre Lorde Award and a Lambda Literary Award. Yes, Yes Books recently released her first nonfiction book, Gathering Voices, Creating a Community-Based Poetry Workshop. She is the co-creator and co-editor of Underbelly, a website focused on the art and magic of poetry revision. Everyone, please help me welcome Marty McConnell. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we've got some folks still rolling in and I have a feeling that's going to happen over the next little while, but that is all good. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we uh, are really, really excited tonight to have Viola uh, Lee and Sun Young Shin joining us this evening. A um, couple of quick logistical things. Um, what am I saying? Uh, please do plan to stay on mute. Um, we did our last, well, this is a new series. Um, and so our last month we did it webinar style so that we could control everybody's sound. And it was a ringing void of silence. Um, and so we really felt like this was an opportunity, like we'll just go regular old Zoom and trust everybody to um, show their faces and um, also, in some cases, hold up pictures of hearts like someone is doing, and it's so adorable. Um, so we can get, uh, you know, get a good sense of, of really being in the same space together. So thank you for being here, for being part of that. Um, depending on how much time we have at the end, we will do um, a Q&A. So with that, I want to invite you, um, as you're listening to our readings tonight, um, as questions arise, feel free to drop those in the chat box and we'll just pluck out a couple of those um, and ask them of our poets at the end of the evening. Um, following this reading, there is a workshop. Um, it is completely booked. Um, so hopefully you got registered if that's something you're excited about. Um, and so just to remind folks that we will be closing out this Zoom and opening up that Zoom separately. Um, last thing on the announcements, we our next uh, reading series event will be December 15th. It'll be featuring Ilana Bell and Rich VR. I'm very, very excited to have them close out the year for us. So please mark your calendars. Um, if you're not on our mailing list, please join that. And with that, I think let's just go into the reading. We're gonna start off um, being graced by um, Viola Lee. And I'm just pulling up her information here so I don't forget anything. Um, Viola, graduated from NYU with an MFA in poetry. Her book, Lightning After the Echo, was published by Another New Calligraphy. She's published poems in literary journals throughout the US and lives in Chicago with her husband, son, and daughter. She teaches first, second, and third graders at Near North Montessori School. And I think some of her students might actually be joining us tonight. Um, one of the things that I, um, loved uh, that I found in talk, uh, looking into Viola online was this description of her book um, from Another New Calligraphy. It says, the poems in Lightning After the Echo concern themselves with the passage of time 
and the seemingly inconsequential items it so often glosses over. The body and its shortcomings are featured throughout, but greatly outweighed by Lee's attention to the sheer quantity of objects she is surrounded by, shampoo and frying pans, tofu and rice, scissors and staplers, boots and balloons, shake and bake and bubble yum, mixtapes and forks, plywood and glass, cake mix and coffins, blankets and bottles, envelopes and oranges, mirrors and ink, on and on, and in the end you become all of it the houses, the windows, and the ash. I'm so excited to hear Viola share some of her work with us. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so before I begin, just a really big shout out to the Poetry Center of Chicago. Thank you so much, Helene, for all your work. And thank you, Kundaman Midwest. And thank you, Marty, for hosting. Um, and then thank you, Sun Young Shin, for, um, for reading today as well. Um, so really briefly, before I start reading, um, I wanted to talk really briefly about um, last week I attended a virtual discussion through the American Academy of Poets, and it was led by a poet named Brenda Hillman, and my former teacher, Murray, Murray Howe, was there. And one thing that she shared, it, it was a discussion about this idea of work and labor in writing. And there were so many emotions that came out of this discussion and um, like a lot of tears. But I feel like also that, um, you know, something, something, so many emotions that come when learning something new. And Marie Howe talked about how writing is a really hard act. And oftentimes there are these force fields that you have to get past in order to begin the work. And so um, perhaps the force fields are like the distractions that prevent us from the work um, and eventually the joy that comes with, with it. Um, but like writing, reading too requires a lot of work and labor. And so I'm gonna read five poems today. Um, the first one, um, I teach at Near North Montessori School some, and I do see some of my students. Um, and um, it's a community that I love. And recently my students actually coordinated and planned a variety show to celebrate our classroom community. And so I wanted to write this poem. This, um, it's a love poem maybe, maybe all the poems are love poems, but it's actually to celebrate the near North Montessori community and also all the people that I've met along the way, including um, a Chicago artist named Jerry Kaiser, and then also a young poet who we've been working with named um, Faisal from Bangladesh. Anyway, this is a kind of a celebration to them. The poem is called Forget the Flowers. Forget the Flowers. I found you there in the city where I fell in love with the streets and that 24 hour laundry mat down the block. The neighborhood of concrete and alleys, train lines, skylines, that wild starry sky as if anything could look midnight blue and dusty. That glimmer when I met you there in that city, that city there, that bonfire beach on sand reminds me that the light is wild, just like where hearts go, just like where we will go. And those other cities may never say your name, but our lives will outlive this bend. Back and here, you and I return, continue to go back to return, to reset, to find you. I found you, I found you. Um, this next poem is uh, was written this summer, visiting my husband's family in Virginia. Um, so many um, experiences that we often go through together as we travel through time together. Um, but the poem is called The Black Bear. In all of my life, I would never write a poem with this title. But recently, on the drive home through the Blue Ridge Mountains from the farm, I've come to terms with my own life. While driving, I remember my friend of 40 years, she laughs from out of her bed and shares, we're all going to die. She tells me she would travel from Albuquerque to my funeral. She's always been dark, truthful, I guess too. I'm not ready to go there. I'm not ready to go there, I say. Lexington, Covington, White Sulphur Springs, just killed a gnat in the car. I begin to understand the black bear while driving my children, them in, 
them in the back seat eating chips and lifesavers, road food, not too much water, watching movie, movie, watching a movie. My husband naps, he'll battle sleep later. Once at camp, I knew a man who taught me everything he knew about being outside. I was a young child then. He taught me to make fire, gathering sticks and branches from out of the woods, dry dead pine needles, taught me wild carrots were root of Queen Anne's lace, told me stories and legends, taught me the constellations in air, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, Orion's Belt. I think of him as I write this. Think of him this year as I've learned of his passing. Think of him and his old body as I'm driving through the mountains. The mountains were in his name. He wore them often. Beckley, Charleston, Huntington. I think I understand the black bear as I look at the clouds. Bulldog, upside down bat wing, tree, a frog. As an adult, I've learned the word for this, Piadolia a need to see familiar forms in disordered images, like clouds or constellations, pyodolia, bodies of lovers intertwined in the branches, bodies of lovers in two clouds, bodies breaking bread, two baby bears follow their mother, Vanceburg, Maysville, Alexandria. I think I understand the black bear as we drive through these foothills, farm and land, my husband now working on a crossword puzzle, the kids now asleep. As we celebrate the 4th of July with family, friends, a young couple leaves the farm in the dark. My mother-in-law shares her secret to any family reunion. Let your children love whoever they love. My sister-in-law and I talk while picking out berries from a plastic blue colander, taking out rotted seeds, tiny branches, parts, stem, and leaf. One daughter shares she loves looking at the ridges and mountaintops while driving. Often I'm not looking at the trees or the native plants, but looking at the houses, the shutters, the porches, the flags, the signs resting on the land, playing the property game. Can I live here? Will whoever I live near accept my children for who they are, for what they are? St. Maurice, Lafayette, Crown Point. In Virginia, we stayed in a homestead cab cabin a quarter mile from the farmhouse. My sister-in-law and her African husband say, would like to believe this place was a homestead cabin. While sleeping there late at night, late at night, encased in chinked logs and wire mesh, my husband and I in the small bedrooms up small bedroom upstairs, my children on air mattresses and sleeping bags. I begin to closely listen to my sister-in-law and begin to see how slaves could very well have labored here. I see it now, her, this mother, becoming a black bear, giving birth to her two live children, a large white pot filled with water, the same rocking chair rocking back and forth. Stopping at a gas station, two men walk up to pay for gas. One of them wears a red shirt that says, the second protects the first. I'm suddenly looking for my son and daughter in the aisle of hot dogs spinning on metal, chips and hard candies. I wish this man far away stars and a movement towards depth and exit. As we say goodbye to family members, I think of all the deaths of this year. Another wish towards never repeating the latter. On the farm and around the mountain, there have been recent black bear sightings. Supposedly the black bear has two baby cubs. I've been thinking about land about the Monacan Indians, about how hard I work to provide the best life for my son and daughter, thinking about what all this means. Gary, Chicago, my daughter's uncle discovered a box turtle in the grass during our travels. He drove it over to her and, he, and she named it Shelly. What is this need to keep, to own, to collect, to name? I don't know where the black bear hides, but it's somewhere in the forests of this mountain. The bear and her cubs continue to venture out during the day and go back into hiding at night as my son and daughter continue to walk in and out of spaces of the farm. I'm thinking how all this protection keeps me animal and now see clearly what someone once asked me, I've never thought to pray. This next poem, um, it's, uh, it was recently published in a journal called Crosswinds Literary Journal, and it's called Stars and You. Stars and You. Some scientists believe our star had a companion, may have been swept away by astronomical objects. 
Meanwhile, some other scientists now say that the highest form of intellect is intuition. My intuition tells me that our bodies will come back in another form, perhaps as constellations in that river of stars. If so, so be it. Let our intuition, let our bodies, let the constellations and the stars, let all these things begin again so that I can come back and look for you. Um, this next poem is a poem to celebrate my background of growing up in a Korean uh, family. And I would say it's both a celebration and a reflection on this idea. It's a celebration in that, um, I, you know, to celebrate, um, yeah, my, my Koreanness, if that even makes sense, and a reflection on this idea of grief and my mother's grief, grief and perhaps how um, grief manifests in people in different ways. Um, it was also published in the literary journal called Another Chicago Magazine, and it's called Kimchi. Kimchi. Whenever we hear of another death in the family, my mother will often bury herself in the basement, immersing her body into hours and hours of kimchi making, squatting with big earthen jars and large silver aluminum bowls. I remember using one of them to bathe my son when he was first born. My mother layers the Napa cabbage, covers in a blanket of light green and white scallions, shutting the folds of the cabbage in rhizome of ginger, tucking in bulbs of allium sadavan, then flavoring in a disaccharide of glucose sugar and dried red pepper flakes. How often I see those red peppers, the color of blood, sun drying on a blanket while walking around my father's village, a tobacco farm and that tiny living space attached. We often wondered how so many family members could share a room together, sleeping on a floor out of necessity. What is healing for my mother is making this even saltier. She uses some form of fish or those tiny minuscule pink salted shrimp. When her brother died, I was 10. He was the uncle I would read about only in photographs. I remember watching her from the window of the basement door, the forceful motion into layering the pepper onto the leaves of the Napa cabbage, a metal bowl singing from the movement and pressure, all the energy and force to move a body when it's grieving. Intentionally, she cut, diced, slivered, a weight growing, growing when folding something onto itself. Last year after my cousin's death, my mother and her sister-in-law made kimchi out of pounds and pounds of Joshian radish, burying themselves in the work, burying themselves and sustaining their family. Never once did they speak of the mental illness continually being buried in the bodies of family members. Never once did they speak of the healing properties of the spice, the pepper, the garlic. Instead, they just move along the way my mother moves along after hearing of each death the way the bodies of the dead move along to their new form, the way that everything that is made by hand moves along, changes in form, changes in body, the way that this fermented spice, pepper, and garlic moves along, mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, moving through the body, moving without a sound, moving, 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 the way the air moves while the house is soundless with sleep, the way the cold leaves and the wind move on the roof of the warm, warm house, the way thoughts and images move, becoming stronger after each passing, passing, passing. And then this last final poem is, um, uh, it, um, so I, I every Saturday, um, my, my poetry group, we meet and there are poets from all over the world, New York, Bulgaria, Santiago, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York, perhaps we're all New Yorkers at heart because that's where we all met. Um, but this poem is, uh, was also recently published in a journal in a Chicago journal called After Hours. And uh, I want to just give a big shout out to After Hours, the editors of After Hours. The poem is called The Poem and All the Things. Once I fell in love with a poem. I gave her all I had, everything and three times more. But the poem, the poem let me inside and gave me a life. The poem gave me a life with you in it. You and the kids and the dead mouse that day 
three missing teeth in a matter of a week, trees distressed in the snow, wires popping out of a broken cold wall in our old house, the frosted dirt and the warm compost, the linen scarves eaten by moths, the small stars on the label of the store-bought maple syrup and the plastic bag of Honeycrisp apples. I once fell in love with a poem and she gave me a house, groceries and a salary, and you to share my secrets, all those abstract nouns, the work of folding them into all the things of the world, all the th things that contain other things, all the ins, all the ends, all the things that begin again, all these things that remind me to begin again, even, even in the brokenness of the everyday that erupts into being, especially at night, a campfire's blue light, the dripping come spring. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, Viola. Wonderful. Can we unmute and applaud for just a quick moment? If folks are, anybody's close enough to their machine. Great. All right, moving right along. We are so excited to welcome Sun Young Shin. Um, who is a Korean-born writer based in Minneapolis, whose fourth book of poems, The Wet Hex, will be published by Coffee House Press in 2022. She is also the editor slash co-editor of three anthologies of essays, most recently, What We Hunger For, Refugee and Immigrant Stories About Food and Family, and the author slash co-author of two illustrated books for children. Um, there was something that I found on the old internets um, that the Knight Foundation said um, about her work. And they said, um, Shin's poems deal in pain and love and alienation, but she weaves those well-worn themes into something fresh, a contemporary fairy tale in verse about the making and unmaking of both identity and nations, fitting for a post-colonial, uneasily globalized world. Her poems are at once intimate and mythic in both tone and character. They're visually complex and self-consciously oblique, hard to parse, but laden with indelible imagery. So with that stage set, please join me in welcoming Sun Young Shin to the stage. Thank you so much, Marty, and thank you so much, Helene, and the Blue Hour, and Kundiman, and Viola. Those were just stunning, um, really, really beautiful. Thank you so much for those poems, and thanks everyone for being here for poetry and community. Uh, it's just, it's really beautiful. So I'm going to read three poems, I think, and. Yeah, then we, we have some discussion. So the first poem is called Specimens of Immortality. And these three, I know you're not supposed to read like from the new book. I know I'm gonna be reading from the new book if I get to be alive for the new book. Like nothing is taken for granted, but you know, if I get to live through um, some years of the next book, I'll be reading from this book, but I'm just, um, yeah, I'm ready to read from this book, even though it's not coming out till next year. So, because what is time? So it's called Specimens of Immortality, and there's a lot of poems about extinction and, you know, taxidermy and Darwin and just um, a variety of different things that we're, um, we're all living with in this catastrophic time of also great adaptation. Specimens of Immortality, uh, Baroque elaborations and tableau of the dodo, white morning doves suspended by invisible wire. All the rabbits wear turtle shell helmets and face the sunrise as an army of sweet. Sentinels everywhere, hidden bones like flutes of wire. Perpetual alert to the guards of the necropolis. You are the largest of the lionesses with an assortment of cubs that died before you were born. The birth of death, seedless grapes sown in the vineyard. 
Museum guard cultivars of boredom, the gore, the charge, the wall of horns. Eyes ever last the horizon, prey or predator. Freeze us in the hunt, in the rut, in the reliefless past. Your beauty is made mostly of proteins. Astringent portraiture, salts and cures and trophy. Trophy with concealed bullet wounds, the soft solace of killing. The school of beauty saved from the burning. Sightless zoo, breathless savanna, glass forest. Dioramas of longing. Big game hunter, the new world, the safari. The feral, the wild, the stampede, the old, the lame, the wounded, the wolf and the lamb lie together at the end of the world. Your horns ground to medicine, your blood blown into glass. Thank you. The second poem is called, I Wandered Into a Mass Extinction Event. So I grew up in Brookfield, Illinois, um, after coming to the United States. And I, since it's kind of like a Chicago crowd, I feel like, you, you know, I feel like I have a real kind of Chicago, not like accent, but, you know, um, so I just, I feel like I'm amongst, you know, my people. Um, but I live in Minneapolis. Okay, I wandered into a mass extinction event. Before I knew what was happening, I renounced my humanity in an attempt to escape the fate of my betters and strangers. The floods gathered up the last of the patients in small cork boats that fell from the sky like leaves from a maple tree in autumn's last exhalation. What was everything I could sacrifice for a Russian Soyuz space suit? Something worn in and vacuum tested? Just give me a sign, I said, cursing the gods and demons of my forefathers. With the helmet's face shield down, I had difficulty panning gold from the rivers of Colorado, but I said, I will prevail. The bracelets and anklets I made with the metal chinkled and chankled, and I, caparisoned like a fine knight's horse, encouraged my prancing and unyielding vanity. I wrote obituary after homage, after ode, after elegy for every species larger than R slash care nothing for the world of letters. The trees recoiled at the cannibalism of paper. We buried every book deep, so deep a place, a place without the language of science. Thank you. These are all prose poems. So you are not missing anything in the way of line breaks. <laughs> I have slashes. I don't know, you know, just um, prose poems. Okay. With poetry nerds. Um, this one is called the. Uh, um, What's it called? It says, uh, it's titled, He Said That We Should Turn Back. He said that we should turn back before it was too late, before my child was born. I said, it is not a child, it is a series of veils, each made from the silk of the worms I ate as penance for my crimes. What crimes, he said, have you committed? None, I said, I was given them as gifts to become the mother of all criminals to give birth to nothing but endless doors made of infinite texture, texts, pure feeling. At the word doors, the worms came to life and began producing skein after real, pure white ink, white creature, a creature. He began to slap me, punch me, kick me, and I fell to the loosened ground, chunks of salt falling from my rough hair. Children came startling out of the bushes to collect the salary. Already savoring the rampion, a congregation of hungers. 
Coiled on the ground, guarding my blue face, my vacant ears, all the murk settled between them, I began to sing a lullaby. Sleep, little thing, shudder, thine eyes bright and divine. All the world's lakes of fire began to plunge further into the earth. Thank you. Um, I feel like I'm not giving you your hard earned money's worth. Wait, <laughs> it's only 802. <laughs> Let me read one more. Perfect. <laughs> We're unionized here at this poetry factory. <laughs> and, okay, um, I'll read just one more. Uh, okay, some of these are just so weird. I don't even know what's going on. Um, this seems like, this seems like a Moby Dick kind of crowd. I don't know. I'm, I'm projecting. You're like, no, it's not. <laughs> We're leaving. <laughs> but so this is like an erasure um, of, but it's still on the page. It's like everything is gray and then the non erased are like darker gray. So, but it's from, it's from um, chapter 42, the whiteness of the whale in Moby Dick. And so the epigraph, and then I'll just read the non-erased parts. Um, what the white whale was to Ahab has been hinted, what at times he was to me as yet remains unsaid. So it's called whiteness a spell throne because a spell throne is the last part of this section of text. Whiteness refiningly enhances beauty, even barbaric. Siam, one figure of a snow white Austrian empire, human race itself, white man, mastership over every dusky tribe. Whiteness has been gladness, a white day, innocence of brides, whiteness, majesty of justice, kings and queens, milk white steeds, symbol of divine spotlessness and power, white forked flame, holiest on the altar, and great Jove himself, snow white bull, Latin word for white, sacred vesture, white is the passion of our Lord, white robes redeemed, great white throne, holy one, white like wool, sweet, honorable, sublime, innermost idea, strikes more panic to the soul, thought of whiteness, coupled with any object, terrible, heightened, terror, furthest bounds, white bear of the poles, we have bears in our poems, white shark of the tropics, smooth, flaky whiteness, transcendent horrors, ghastly whiteness, abhorrent mildness, loathsome, dumb gloating, white shrouded, albatross, pale dread, white phantom, first through that spell. Thank you everyone so much. Thank you, Sun Young. We could un unmute and applaud. Hey, hey. hey. Yeah. Woo! Bravo. Woo! Good going. So beautiful. Fantastic. Great. So we've got a few minutes for um, a Q&A. And since um, we were all too enraptured to enter questions into the chat box during that, I'm going to, I'll start off with one. And then if there's other questions, feel free to drop them into the chat box. Um, so I have so many questions, but I'm going to go with this one. Um, and this is both for um, Viola and for Sun Young. Um, I was having a conversation the other day with someone about the the tension between redundancy and repetition in poems and like how we walk that line, right? Like how we use repetition without it becoming redundant. I feel like you're both masters of that in your own ways. And I'm wondering if you can speak to how you do it, <laughs> whether that is something that you think about or if that's um, something that just happens sort of organically. I'd um, love to hear your thoughts on that. Viola, please answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> so Marty, just to, um, the, so the question is how, how to use re repetition in po or how we use repetition in poetry. Yeah, basically without it becoming redundant, right? So I was talking with another poet and they were like, I feel like when other people repeat words in poems, it's amazing. And when I repeat words in poems, I'm just saying the same thing over and over again. And so we were talking about how does how one sort of like walks that line. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe it's it, um, maybe I'm wrong, but like 
I do feel like sometimes by um, by adding like repetition, it like not only is it like emphasizing like certain ideas, but it also adds just like a music, like music, mm -hmm. it makes it more musical. Um, and um, And sometimes it's also like, I have no idea how to end this poem. And so I'm just gonna say this word three times. <laughs> And it always works. It always works. Like end that last word with like, just like use the same word three times. And like, it's an ending. It, it always works. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's when Candyman appears. So, you know, it's truly magic. Um, that's such a sweet question. I've never like redundant, like, uh, that's so interesting because, um, I don't worry about redundant because no, like no one reads my poetry. So it's like, who cares what I say? You know, clearly like, that's not oh, true. <laughs> I mean, well, some of these people are my friends. They're 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 just being super supportive. Um, I mean, it's po you know, it's poetry. It's free. Um, it's yeah. I love that question. I'm Marty. I feel like Marty. I'm sure you're not right. That doesn't work in your poetry. Um, but let me try to give like an actually helpful answer. Okay. Um, I think I often think about the writing process, like sewing a garment and the words are, you know, stitching is the thread and the needle is the voice or whatever. And if, you know, repetition helps me come back to the garment that I'm sewing. And if I get too far away, whether it's sound ideas, style, something, I feel like, well, I'm in, I'm now I'm in this wrong garment. I'm in this other thing. Mm. You know, maybe I need to actually do some unsewing and come back to this garment. I mean, the other thing, the other thing about redundancy is I feel like if you listen to pop music, the pop music that I grew up on um, from the 20th century, there's like eight words to the whole song. And then the, the, the outro is like, that same phrase 10,000 times. So, you know, I just have never ever in this whole poetry, like circus of decade, like I've never thought about the, the worry of being redundant. And I think that's, I think that's so, um, says a lot about my carelessness, <laughs> but. <laughs> or you're just, your natural ability to not be redundant, right? Well, we could like, also frame it that way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I grew up in the Catholic church grow, going to mass every Sunday. And right. it's like, you're just, uh, you're just on this earth to be punished. So I don't really mm -hmm. know. I could never feel like too much repetition in a poem was redundant maybe. Yeah, it's so interesting. Thank you. It's a great question. You know, can I add to that really quick? Or I, I also feel like sometimes with writing poetry, it's like, it's like what Marie Howe talks about, like entering this force field or this force shield. And it's like this space, you know, like who was it that, that the author Dorian Lowe also said, sometimes with writing poetry, it's kind of like snorkeling where you actually <laughs> feel like you are underwater. You, you were literally, you feel like you've been underwater for two, like literally five minutes and then you come out and it's like two hours later. <laughs> like, right. that, yeah. I thought that was perfect. But like, I do feel like sometimes with writing poetry, maybe the re redundancy or the repetition in order to get to that space too, it's similar to what you just shared about being Catholic. I know I grew up Catholic too, and it's so much um, a part of my upbringing, but I feel like also this idea of like the idea of prayer or like even like when I think about a rosary and like saying that same prayer over and over again, like puts you in this headspace where it's, mm -hmm. like, it's, it, it's like you are magically, um, magically snorkeling maybe. Maybe you're snorkeling. <laughs> Magically snorkeling while saying the rosary. I mean, I've got it all. It's yeah. Yeah, it's the um, I mean, it's the oral tradition, right? And just sound keeping us in a pattern to keep us with whatever the, the spell we're casting needs that needs to be cast. And as a communal poetry, as a communal, you know, ritual, um, the repetition is often important. Yeah, never, it's never redundant, Marty, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Whatever you say is good. Whatever you're writing, I'm sure is necessary. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, we just have a minute or two left. So I'm going to ask you a real quick question. Um, if it's something that's come up a couple of times in um, our, oh, Charlotte has a question. I'm going to go ahead and read hers. Do both poets read their work aloud as part of their process? Great. Let's end with that. Do e either or both of you read your work aloud as part of your writing or revision process? Yes. Um, or you and you read it in a reading, and then you realize some hmm. parts are dead. You know. Um, so if I if I neglect to read it before it goes to publication or something, um, I'll be sorry later. So it's really good, good practice. Yeah, really good practice. Thank you. You know, it's really interesting because this Saturday group that I meet with, we, we, we don't read our own poems, we actually read each other's. And it's always so interesting to hear other people read um, the work, the, the work, because I do feel like there are moments where it's, it's also like the reading of it, their reading of it, um, kind of you know, like, oh, wow, that, that is not what I, you know, that, that, or that, is, <laughs> that, that is a word, it, it, it just like brings in a really interesting perspective to hear others read it out loud. But I also feel like um, it's really interesting because I feel like sometimes a lot of people have like, uh, will, will say that they will say their poems first and then write it. But I think so much of it is like the writing first always and then the, the practice and the reading of it. But I feel like reading the reading of it also like, um, it like takes it out of the body. Like so much of writing is like in the body and I feel mm -hmm. like you read it out loud. It like, it's like so much about sharing and like it, it actually, not vomit, but like it's like <laughs> you're, you're taking it out of the body, right? Yeah. <laughs> An yeah. exorcism. Right. Exorc right. 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 And also that resonance, right? When it hits the air and like how that changes our understanding of it, I think can be really powerful. Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, a big thank you to Viola and Sun Young for sharing your genius with us this evening.